So, uh, Kikok, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for, for coming to this interview. Um, we have done interviews like this on the life and thought of uh, activist thinkers, and we've interviewed about uh, 60 people all around the world from all continents. And uh, it's such a pleasure for us to be uh, hearing from you today. You have uh, so many exciting experiences. I'm sure, um, well, we could go on and on, but maybe we could start with uh, some uh, questions. So maybe uh, could you tell us uh, some of the main um, turning points in your life? Uh, and uh, later on, uh, we would, of course, also like to hear uh, from you to uh, how how you come to be uh, uh, what you are and who you are today and uh, what were some of the things that happened in your childhood or as a teenager that shaped your personality uh, etc and of course uh, your your interest in the philosophy of medicine of science yes so uh, please <laughs> Well, thank you so much for asking me. It's a great honor and a pleasure. Um, now, maybe, maybe I could kick off my biography by saying something about my name, which is indeed very curious. Uh, first of all, anyone who doesn't know anything about me would immediately say it's a male name which is quite true. Uh, now, in, well, Keacock, of course, uh, in this kind of English uh, transliteration means nothing to anybody, least of all, even to myself. But obviously, some people listening to uh, my name for the first time may think that I'm even Japanese because it sounds a bit like a Keiko in Japanese. I think that's a proper Japanese name, but then that's all very misleading for the, sim for the simple reason that um, when my mother was carrying me, and my mother had, I think, I'm never quite sure, because each time I asked her, she sort of, you know, gave me a different number. <laughs> but I suppose she did have something like 10 to 11 pregnancies, of which only half of us survived. And so I am the youngest of five children. And my father, my brother, my only brother was therefore right in the middle of as it turned out, four girls. So after my brother was born, my father, being very traditional Chinese, was desperate for another son. So he kept on saying, the next one, the next one will be a son, the next one will be a son. Then my uh, sister, who is just slightly older than I am, who now lives in Australia, turned out to be a disappointment because she was a girl. So after her, then I, my mother carried me and he said, oh, this time I'm really, really sure it's a son. I said, look at the um, type of pregnancy. She said, all oh, the indications, the indicators are that it's a man. So he probably sat down and thought up a name for this so-called male child he would soon have. So he said, um, you know, the word, um, if I pronounce it in, in Putonghua, it will be Ji Guo. So Ji is Ji Chu, the Ji, that means foundation. Guo Jia the Guo means country. So I had this very auspicious, uh, dreadfully serious thing <laughs> called foundation of the nation or something like that. Or alternatively, some people had said to me, Ji is Christ, you see. So uh, I am really the foundation for Christianity. All very embarrassing, whichever interpretation <laughs> you take of my, of, of my name. Now, I could have given myself an English name uh, later on when I grew up, but I never did. I stuck with that strange name called uh, Lee Keacock or Keacock Lee, whichever way you put it. And, and so there I am. And that is also uh, 
Yes, so to uh, complete that little story, when I was born, my father then took one look at me and said, oh, another girl. So my mother said, uh, what about her name? So I said, oh, she can have it because I've already dreamt it up. <laughs> so then I was stuck with a male name. Like, okay, now that is my personal name, which is rather strange. Then my surname is equally strange because my surname, I've been constantly told by Chinese people, not, none other than Chinese people, that I have made a mistake about my own surname because the Li is the Sheng Li, the Li, the Li of victory, of profit, or whatever, uh, and not Li, which is the Mu Zi Li, which is the, um, the Li, the Li uh, made up of the tree on the top and the, uh, and the child at the bottom. So I'm not a Mu Zi Li, I'm a Li, a Sheng Li, the Li. So people said, look, you made a mistake about your name. And it was said of all members of my family and including my father, uh, including my brother. Now I'm fine because I am primarily an academic uh, who leads a very sedentary um, private life. So nobody bothers about me, fortunately. But my brother happened to play a big, a biggish role, I suppose, in, uh, um, in the Chinese community in Manchester. So he was constantly pestered and said, look, you've got your surname wrong. You know, the members of the Chinese community in Manchester will tell him, you are not Lee. We've never heard of someone with a surname like that. So you are Lee. So my brother sort of got fed up with this interrogation of his name. So one day he went to my father and he said, dad, he said, I'm very sorry but there is this pressure from the Chinese community in Manchester saying that I'm not a Lee, but a Lee, but I will be very unfilial if I change my surname from the real surname from Lee to Lee. So he said, um, what shall I do? So my he hadn't expected my father to be so agreeable. My father said, oh, well, one has to be practical. If people insist on you being a Lee for the purpose of <laughs> your life, or you better be a Lee. So in Chinatown, in Manchester, for the when he was alive, it was always referred to as Mr. Uh, Lee. So anyway, of course, when he died, which was mm, in 1996, so I... Um, had carved on his tombstone, of course, not Lee, but Lee, you see, and gave, you know, the original place from which the family came. And so all members of the Chinese community were very, very puzzled by why he is not a Lee, but a Lee. <laughs> but I think they were too polite to ask me. So they all, I think, assume that I, because they claim that I'm an English educated, had made a mistake. Now, I never bothered to find out the truth, <laughs> but I still think that some people in Chinatown in Manchester today think that I have made a mistake. But of course I have not made a mistake. And so that's my name. Now, to tell you another, uh, a story. I was very pleased when I discovered um, oh, some years ago that Matteo Ricci, you know, the famous Jesuit uh, priest who went to China, the first of the Jesuits who went to China. Now he was called Ricci, Matteo Ricci. So our friend then thought that he must have a Chinese name, fair enough. So uh, so he was very discriminating. He called himself Li Ma Du. Now he didn't use the common variety, garden variety Li. He chose my surname, Li. <laughs> so you see, the man was very discriminating. He preferred not to be part of the love I see but to become this kind of uh, exotic Lee to which I belong. 
So now I can claim Matteo Ricci as part of my clan, which is quite a joke, but there you are. Now, you may be since 1900, it's not um, in the hundred surnames, where does the surname come from? Uh, it's not a wonder that people think that really have made a mistake because you can count the number of leaves on your fingers. I think today I'd be surprised if more than 15,000 people have that surname. I've never done any real research on it, but I think it's so rare that not many people have that surname. But I'm told that in Hong Kong, there is a, rest, uh, a very wealthy person who runs a restaurant called Li Yuan. Is that right? Anyway, he might even have gone bust by now and you wouldn't know about him. But anyway, I was told that that family is a Liam. I never made any contact with them, so I wouldn't know whether they dreamt it up to stick it up on their on their business or whether they are genuinely a, a, a Lee. But anyway, <laughs> the story of where the Lee comes from, uh, I've since my... The first inkling I had was finally when I got a copy of the family genealogy from my father uh, via my sister, the one who lives in Australia. And my father left China in a hurry. And as a result, he had no time to, he, he actually had to go into exile, so he self-exiled, he exiled himself to Malaysia, and that's where I grew, uh, was born and lived. But to cut a very long story short, my father claimed that he was, um, what's the word, he was mistaken for his brother. His brother was a very active member of the trade union movement of the time, and the government of the uh, then was after him. Um, this was in the 1920s, you see. And, um, but because when the police came <laughs> to arrest people, my uncle, the real activist, got wind of it and dis disappeared, leaving my father looking very much like his own brother. <laughs> so, in that means that he would do. So he was actually, um, according to my mother, this is, he would have been executed. But for the fact that my mother, whose family was uh, quite rich, because they ran what might be called, I don't know what it's called, a, a, a Jiangyuan, which is, I suppose, a pickle factory of some description in Guangzhou at that time, uh, um, in Canton at that time. And so uh, my mother appealed to her family to bribe the officials of the magistrates of that time to let him go. So they say, fine, we will let you go, but you must leave the country. So my father was given, my parents were given two weeks, something like that, to pack up their affairs and, and disappear from the land. So my father said, I can't leave, he said. My entire Lee family is in China. How could I go somewhere else? So my mother said, do you want your life or do you want your, um, your, 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 your ancestral past? So he had no choice. So he said, let me at least copy down some information from the family genealogy. But the family genealogy, I'm told, is a huge tome because as I'll tell you in a minute, it dates from the foundation of the Zhou period, you know, at the end of the Shang dynasty. And so <laughs> it was so thick and so many generations, he didn't have time. So he just... Um, chose the Qing period, the late Ming to the Qing period, and copied down as much because there was no photocopying in those days. So he just did it by hand. And so he did that, but with a, a, a prelim to tell in, the gene, in his fragmented genealogy to say that the family actually comes from um, Henan, 
So we belong, uh, uh, we are Northern tribe, in other words, uh, a family. And so that is why on my brother's tombstone, I put down as the original place, because in China, you've got to put down the original <laughs> province from which you come or what. So I put him down as Hernan and not uh, Malaysia, because basically we Lees come from Hernan. So the people in Chinatown looked at me strange and said, oh, this sister is quite crazy. You know, she makes up stories, stick it up on the tombstone. But as I said, they're far too polite to, inqu to in inquisition me on that point. And I, they're very nice to me, but uh, I got a feeling they think that I am a fantasist of some description, but I'm not. So in other words, then, I have now traced to um, um, that, as I say, if you, um, there is in a Beijing, in the National Chinese Museum in Beijing today, a, um, a bronze vessel, a particular type of bronze vessel called a gui. Now, this gui is very interesting. I think it was ex uh, it was found by accident um, in the uh, in the nineteen seventies when a peasant somewhere in Hernan dug up the soil and there it turned up. Right now, this gui is more interesting than others because of the inscription on it. And so that is how, in the end, I know where the family originally came from. Because if you now were to go to the National Museum in Beijing, you will find this gray and there is an inscription. And the inscription says something like this. Now I'm doing it from memory because I didn't have time to check. I should have, but I was busy doing something else. And, um, and this inscription says, that at the Battle of Mu Ye, which is the battle which, uh, which where the Zhou, later what became the Zhou dynasty, Zhou Wang, uh, defeated the Shang, you know, that the other Zhou of the Shang dynasty, of the late Shang dynasty. So it was the Battle of Mu Ye. Now historians have been disputing the, the date, the actual date of the Battle of Mutye for, for a long, long time. Some of them got it almost right, but not quite. And so, um, but there was, a, um, they got it wrong either way about by about 17 to 30 years. But when they discovered, uh, uncovered this particular gray, they found out the exact date of the Battle of Bouye because it's recorded in the inscription. And the inscription, uh, very briefly, is to say that um, there was a, a left-hand scribe of the Zhou King and the right-hand scribe now, I can't remember which scribe it is. I, I suppose the right-hand scribe takes down what the king says, and the, uh, and the left-hand scribe then records when the saying, the assertion of the king is materialized or realized. So I got a feeling from memory now that my ancestor <laughs> was a left-hand scribe because he said in the inscription, that the Battle of Mutye had already taken place, and the um, and the left hand scribe had written it down in what will turn out to be the annals of Zhou his of, of history that uh, when the Battle of Mutye took place. So, in gratitude for the scribe for having uh, written it down in the historical annals. Uh, the Zhou King, I don't know which Zhou King, it, it could be the Zhou Wenwang or Zhou Wuwang, I, I have got a clue, but there you are, the early Zhou, the founders of the Zhou dynasty in the end, um, because they would have inherited, uh, found a lot of bronze material from the Shang dynasty, which they conquered, which they defeated. So they gave 
a lump of bronze to this ancestor. And so this ancestor told, it would be a nice thing to commemorate this honor by making a gui out of it. And so a gui is a kind of a bronze vessel for containing food. And so as a result, the, um, he caused this inscription to be part of the gui. So and that's how uh, history knew when the Mu Ye battle took place, when the Shang was finally defeated. And how I, in the end, realized where I really came from, because my father didn't have time to copy that down, you see. It's a fragmented, very fragmented version of the genealogy that he had. So that is um, one ancestors of the Li, and, and, and definitely um, it says that, um, and other records, historical records, say that the family uh, were descended from a very minor, minor Chu prince. Uh, Chu Guo, because Chu Guo in the old days is where He Dan now is, you see. So the, the, the location is at least right. So it couldn't be total fantasy. But anyway, so the family genealogy from the little bit my father had said, um, it's He Dan, a descendant of a minor Chu, Chu prince of Chu Guo at that uh, uh, at that time. Now, um, and then in his record in the Qing period, is recorded one uh, honorable event which took place in the family, and that is when an ancestor during the Qing dynasty, it could be Qianlong. Um, and uh, you remember Qianlong uh, did a whole compendium of Si Ku Quan Shu. So as a result, a lot of scholars were hired, if you like, to take part in this project. So this ancestor was indeed one of these scholars working in Guo Zijian to uh, carry out this project. And he had the honor of having um, been successful at one of the Kirji exams. Now, whether he managed to reach the highest level of the Kirji exam, I have got a clue either, but he certainly uh, won some, was a successful uh, um, candidate at some level of the Kirji. Um, it couldn't be at a very lowly level because he wouldn't otherwise be co-opted for the uh, Qianlong project. But whether it was a national Kirji or whether it was a provincial Kirji, that I cannot tell you because I've not found out nor is there any evidence so far. Uh, except for going to Guo Zijian and go through the records myself, which I haven't got the time to do, and I have to learn more classical Chinese <laughs> to do that first. And so um, lacking all these um, possibilities, I've just let, let the thing be. So that is the very early beginning his, uh, in historical records that I can trace. Now then, again in 1973, if you remember, and you wouldn't remember, and you would no doubt have read of it, um, there was this famous excavation of three uh, early Han tombs, the Ma Wang Dui Han early Han tombs. Now, Ma Wang Dui early Han tombs consist of a father, a, the wife, and the son. The son died very young. And in one of the tombs, I think it was in the in the son's tomb, which fortunately, from my point of view, had a seal in it. And this seal says um, the family. Uh, I can't remember whether it was a son's tomb or the or the the old man's tomb. But anyway, it says that this this seal is the seal of Li Tang Ho, Marcus Dai. So he was elevated. Uh, he presumably joined the um, the king, the kingdom uh, there to become 
an official of some description. And so he was given this official title of the, the Marquis Dai. So, uh, so as a result, I, we, we know this because, because the, um, the three tombs belong to the Li clan. So there is that, so there is that link there. Now, the other surprising thing I found of late again was, um, well, Colin, who is my husband and I, <laughs> We saved and we scrimmed in order to buy some uh, ceramics uh, and Chinese antique ceramics. We can't afford many, of course. Academic salaries don't allow you to buy <laughs> too many of these things. But whatever few we have, we treasure a lot, right? So one day, uh, Colin bought an uh, what we think is a late Ming or an early Qing incense burner, a Longchan object uh, make, which is in English is a, a salad and ware. So the Longchan ware. Now, because it is an incense uh, burner, and this is the interesting thing, while the rest had the um, the um, the what's it called um oh help me my mind is going the you the um let's call it the varnish because i can't immediately think of the correct term to use but because it is an incense burner the part which contains the burning incense cannot have the you so it was left as terracotta ware because the rest was already covered with this varnish, right? So now then, Colin bought this and we say, oh, how very interesting. And all these years, when we looked at Chinese, ancient Chinese antiques, uh, ceramics, and when we buy one or two that we can afford, I've always said to Colin, I said that the Lee family is such a long feudal clan, tribe, Surely, in the old days, the Lee family must have owned many of these objects. Now, how do I know when we buy one and it doesn't belong in the past to my family? So Colin said, oh, that is a possibility, of course. But how would we know? So I said, of course, we would never know. Ah, then comes this interesting story. About 20 years ago, I was invited by the philosophy department at Bristol University to uh, give a lecture there. And I knew that there is a very, uh, Colin and I knew that there's a very famous collection of Chinese uh, ceramics in the Bristol Museum, bequeathed to the museum by a pair of Germans who are called the Schiller brothers. Although they are, were Germans, they, made an, they lived in Bristol most of their lives. And so as a result, when they died, they didn't leave it to Germany, they left it to Bristol. And their fortune was based, I think, on importing, being an importer of, uh, of um, uh, dealing in any case with wheat to, to Russia. That is the Schiller brothers. They have this very famous collection. So since there was, so I said to Colin, look, I must go a day early um, and spend the day looking at the Schiller collection. So he said, what a good idea, you just do that at the expense of Bristol University was paying for my trip, you see. So, okay, I went down and I went there and was looking at all the, slowly as I walked down the cabinets and suddenly my eye was caught by an incense, a salad, uh, uh, a long tram, a salad and uh, uh, incense burner, looking exactly like the one that we had just bought. So I said, ah, oh, very good to see that we possess something looking like museum standard. So I walked up to it and it was at a level of display. It was at a level where I could reach because I'm very short, you see. Anything higher up, I wouldn't be able to see. 
but it was at my level of, uh, um, and so as a result, I looked into the inside, the innards, and there in the bit where the burning incense takes place, I find the word Lee written on it, my surname. Now that is, I think, clear proof that it once belonged to a Lee. So I got very excited and communicated with the curator of Bristol University for many years, of a, of a long while, asking her to search out from her archives where that uh, artifact come, came from. She searched and searched, she found only the, um, the record as far as Bristol went, traced the object that uh, to the to the Schiller brothers, having bought it from a dealer, a dealer in um, in in London, but unfortunately the dealer had long ago folded up. Of course, so I can't find the dealer there anymore. <laughs> but the records of that dealer, I'm told, later on, are had been in the, in the company. Uh, in, was got hold of by Brill, and the entire thing now lives somewhere in New York. So I haven't got time to go and check that at all. So anyway, so uh, so it's very interesting that I managed to find an object, at least. So who knows whether my hypothesis is correct or not, but it is a plausible hypothesis that it's once upon a time belonged to, to um, a member um, of the Lee family somewhere in the dimmest past. So uh, that in a small nutshell <laughs> is both my name and my surname were very curious. <laughs> How about if I come in a little bit on that one? Yes, yes because, please. Um, well, you, you know Lao Tzu? Uh, yes, I Lao Tzu. The Taoist, the Taoist. He's the 11th generation uh, of someone uh, who changed his name from your family name to the Li Zi the Li. Yeah. So because of that, uh, he was trying to avoid persecution. Yeah. So, uh, so it's interesting that you were talking about the um, this change of name of your brother mm -hmm. from Li to Li, yeah. Yeah. whereas um, the ancestor of Lao Tzu uh, mm -hmm. uh, changed his name from Li to Li yeah. instead yeah. of word persecution. So in that sense, then I think you may have also some uh, connections to Lao Tzu. And yeah, yes, with, that, the, that, um, with the Lee. Yeah. Yes, yes. That link I did find, but it was so tenuous that I have no means of pursuing the matter further, unless you can put me on the right path. You probably know more than I do. But it is certainly, I discovered uh, through another set of investigations that there is this connection with Lao Tzu. Now, um, strange as this may sound, it could be true. If it is true, it's very weird indeed that um, spiritual, because I find that in terms of Chinese philosophy, I have an interest in Wu Jia, in Confucianism, but my heart is not in it. My heart is in Tao Jia, you see. Taoist philosophy. Now, don't ask me why, but given this strange link, it could be mm, there's something the ancestor up there is telling me to be interested in Tao Jia, in Lao Tzu stuff, and not so much in Ru Jia. Not that I'm not interested in Ru Jia, but certainly Tao Jia speaks to me much, much more. And I found that I'm sort of in terms of my thinking, a Tao Jia philosopher and not a Ru Jia philosopher. Because the Tao Jia has, you know, the iconic uh, um, dy dyadism of yin yang in it. 
And so, um, and Chinese philosophy is really yin yang philosophy. And so that talks to me much more. So that is why, and also later on, when I became interested in philosophy of medicine, there's this direct link, because the link with Wu Jia in terms of Chinese medicine is not, is quite tenuous, whereas with Tao Jia, it's, the link is very, very strong. Mm. Yes, well, thank you. So, um, can you tell us how? Uh, so, you you were living in Singapore or Malaysia for a long time before you yes. went uh, to study in the University of Singapore. Yes. Well, you see, I was born in Kuala Lumpur because my father, my family was exiled. My parents were exiled. Originally, they went to Penang because they had some re a, a, a relative of some description uh, in Penang. But later, then they went down further south um, uh, of, of the peninsula to Kuala Lumpur. So that was where I was born and uh, brought up until the age of 17 to 18. So... Um, so this means that uh, if you want a quick account of that part of my life, um, when my parents uh, exiled themselves to Malaysia and the, the children were born there, then they were faced with this question of how to educate them. My father, of course, was very keen that we, we be Chinese educated. But my mother, because my father said, really, <laughs> uh, 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 such a distinguished family, we cannot allow our children not to know Chinese culture. So my mother be much more practical because she belonged to a commercial family. Uh, not a scholarly family like my father. So the commercial side, the practical side of my mother came forward and said, look here, please, um, the children, if you were to give them an English, uh, a Chinese education, probably will never get good jobs. She said, we are not living in China anymore, you know. So uh, we were all sent to an English uh, school and that's just why uh, I was sent to the missionary school, the uh, convent school um, uh, in, Kuala, in, Kuala, in Kuala Lumpur. So you can say my childhood, therefore, was a clash of civilizations, because in the daytime, I would go to the English school, uh, uh, managed by nuns, and uh, and we were all expected to sooner or later to become converts, especially the Chinese children, because um, of all the various ethnic groups, you cannot convert Malays because uh, the, the Muslim religion and the British government then wouldn't allow Malays to be proselytized. The Indian children were also safe because uh, Hinduism was a very uh, powerful force, religious force within their families. Oh, but we Chinese, you see, we don't have any particular religious uh, um, fanaticism of any kind. So we were fair game for the nuns. You know, all interested in converting, in converting the Chinese uh, uh, students, uh, pupils. So uh, we all clamoured to be converted. Now again, my parents were very wise. In retrospect, I admired their wisdom because you would have expected them to put their foot down and say, no, you can't convert. We are Chinese, you know. The Christianity is, is a Western religion. I cannot convert. Now, if they had said that, I bet you the first thing we one would do, especially me, would be to go and convert, just to annoy them, right? Oh, but when we asked, there was sweetness and light. They say, hmm, not a bad idea, they say, but don't you think you are a bit young? 
Wait till you are 18, and if you are still keen, we would have no objection. Now, that's the way forward. Liberalism <laughs> in disguise. So by being ever so liberal, <laughs> they, they saved me from being converted to, <laughs> to Catholicism. Uh, because uh, I certainly, given my nature, because, um, uh, you know, parents were authority. If authority is a X, then I must do not X. So <laughs> that was me in my young days. So very unsubmissive. And so there you are, you see. So <laughs> I never, uh, never converted. And the nuns were so disappointed, so much so. And, and, and so that was the nuns. And at the, on the other side were also non-conformist, uh, non-conformist Christian missionaries who were also keen to convert. So they came along and tried to convert as well. And indeed, um, about 12 years ago, strangely enough, I was going to the, uh, to the Far East by detouring by uh, Malaysia and Singapore. There was a delay in the flight, and I was sitting there quietly in the transit lounge, uh, resting, when a woman plunged herself next to me, and she said, I know you. So I looked at her. I think I recognized her. She was one of those non-conformist evangelical Christian missionaries who pestered me when I was a child. And so I said, I'm very sorry, I don't recognize you at all, I said. So she said, no, she says, I know you as a child. <laughs> she was about to go into a long rigmarole about my child. So I stopped her in her track by being very, very hard and said, no, I think you are mistaken because I don't want a whole rigmarole of me being, or she be trying to convert me yet again. <laughs> You see what I, I mean? And so to cut a very long story short, there were all these other influences on my childhood. And then my parents decided that uh, it's true, they can't earn a living by going to a Chinese school, but surely they must be exposed to some Chinese culture. So in Kuala Lumpur at that time, there were lots of Chinese parents facing this same problem. So they clubbed together to run a Chinese school of some description up to, um, up to the end of, ju uh, of junior school, I suppose, uh, the end of, uh, for about six years. And this uh, to, um, and this school took place between the uh, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. every day, Monday to Saturday. So there were uh, six classes um, uh, in this school. So once the once the um, uh, the six uh, grades were finished. That was the end of it. So you can say that I had an elementary Chinese education of sorts, of a very peculiar kind. So it means that I could um, write in Chinese. I could read you know, some Chinese, not of, to a very high level, because if you stop at the elementary school, um, your command is not going to be very great, is it? Um, and so, uh, and, and so, in that way, uh, I I was brought up. So now, uh, can I just try to close the door of to prevent the noise in the house from coming through, because the window people are at it. Right? I will be a minute. Sure. So, are there any interesting episodes? So in your in your childhood up to your university years that made you choose your uh, your 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 major. So oh, what right. major did you have and also what made you choose that? Right, right. Now this um includes a very traumatic, a traumatic part of my life because my mother, who wore the trousers in the family basically. She insisted that this sister, who is 13 months older than I am, who, as I said, now lives in Australia, and I 
that we must do medicine. Medicine, she says. Now, I being non-submissive, <clears throat> don't ask me why, but I said, no, not doing medicine. So, um, so when we transferred from the end of what today in Britain we call the fifth form, after we set the equivalent of the GCS, in those days it was called overseas certificate of something or other, you know, something like Korea, but the, today's equivalent is a GCS, uh, GCSE. When we finished that and moved to the sixth form, the common school did not have a sixth form. So we have got to move to the Christian Brothers School, which did have, which is also Catholic, but for boys. But the sixth form were both for, for male and female pupils. So I moved there. And so we had to choose which stream we would go to, the science stream for medicine, of course, or the art stream. So I said, I don't want to do medicine because it came from my mother right anyway, right? And so I was anti-mother, the mother was anti-me. <laughs> so, okay, so I wasn't going to do. So I said to the school, I said, I want to do arts. So the school said, we have no objection. But under the law of the land, this was still British, British Malaysia then, Malaya then, under the rule of the land, we cannot allow you to change just like that, but you've got to go and see the chief education officer in Kuala Lumpur. So I was packed off to see this great white male sitting behind a huge desk to ask for permission to change. So he said he himself had no objection, actually. He says, but for you to change, the rules require that you get, get a letter from your father to permit it. So I said, oh God, how would I fiddle that? I said, <laughs> it didn't occur to me on forging a letter. So I said, okay, if that's the rule, that's the rule. So I went away and thought about it. And so, uh, when I got back home, I found a moment when my mother was away, out, out doing shopping or nattering to people or something. And I called my father and I said, Dad, look, I need a letter from you saying that, um, you know, you must give permission for me to change. So my father said, what would you change to? I said, I want to do arts. So he said, why do you want to do arts? So I said, I want to do philosophy. So he immediately agreed, you see, philosophy talked to my father. So he said, they're fine, he said. But you see, my father didn't know a word of English, neither did my mother. So I had to write the letter myself. And then I didn't forge the signature. I read out to him that he was giving me permission. So I said, you're committing yourself to giving me permission because this is going to the chief uh, education officer, you know. So he said, oh, he's well aware of it. He says, okay, he said, I'll sign it. So he knew how to sign his name in English, but that was all he knew. So he signed it. So I handed it to the chief register. Oh, he was so pleased. So he put it amongst the files and documents in the file. And so that's how I came to uh, uh, do arts and then to do philosophy. When my mother came home and discovered that my father had signed this letter and I had disappeared into the streets of Kuala Lumpur to rush off to the chief education office, she was hoppy mad. She said, you said, you lease, that's it, you are you know, you will beg us all, always choosing the wrong options in life. You and your feudal past and your feudal glory. She said, I don't want any more mention of your glorious Lee feudal past. <laughs> and, and, she, and then she cornered me and she said, look, you smart ass, you have got your way. He said, I can't do anything because you've already tended the letter. So he said, fine, you are on your own now. Financially, don't expect me to support you. 
So I said, fine, if that's a wish, there's nothing much I can do with it. So I was on my own <laughs> financially. <laughs> so I saw my own self through uh, university education. Now, my mother, being my mother, also very stubborn, I shared this trait with her. Uh, she stuck to her guns, I stuck to my guns. So she never gave me a penny. Now you may want to know how I managed to survive financially. Well, fortunately, I said Lao Qian Ye didn't endow me with positive virtues in a woman like beauty. But <laughs> it did endow me with a good brain. And so with this uh, gift of being academically um, okay, fine, I managed to win scholarships. And those scholarships were academic scholarships. And they were cumulative too. In other words, uh, we had at that time to get into the University of Malaysia, or Malaya then it was called, you will have to do an entrance exam. So I did that entrance exam and I was, I was, I suppose, a top candidate for that exam. So I got a scholarship. And then in the meantime, I gave private tuition in English to children whose family was prepared to pay for private tuition. Um, and so I earned some money. And then came the, at the end of the first year in university, another exam, of course, I also was top. So I got another scholarship <laughs> each time at the end of each year by being quite a, 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 a good scholar, I suppose. I won all these uh, scholarships. And so by the time, they were, they, they, in those days, they were a four-year course, not a three-year course. So you do a past degree at the end of three years and in your fourth year, you choose an option to do your honors degree. And in my past degree, I did English and philosophy. But in my honors year, I chose, I chose uh, philosophy. So by the time, and, and then I kept doing private tuition as well. So my mother by then, <laughs> when I finished my, um, my honors degree, or by the time I was going into my honors year, my mother realized that I have accumulated quite a lot of income, you see, from here, there, everywhere. And so she's, and my sister, the one who is in Australia, was doing medicine, of course, because she was submissive. And so my mother loved her. And in those days, a medical course was a six year course. And so uh, she was still going through the paces. So my mother, being very practical, cornered me and said, well, I know that you're now, you know, I wouldn't say rich, but you're very well off now. <laughs> he said, would you mind, you know, uh, using some of that money to, uh, to help me to continue your, your, your sister's medical education? I mean, what choice have I got? So I said, fine, no bother. So, <laughs> From then on, I uh, supported my sister partially, not totally, of course, uh, until she graduated in, 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 in medicine. So my mother, in fact, never forgave me. She, she wouldn't do it to any other of her children. But with me, she was prepared to do this kind of extraction from me because she said, I, was non I am a non-submissive child. And so you've got to tame a non-submissive child. But unfortunately, I couldn't be tamed. I was too wild for her. So there you are. So we ended up by not, uh, uh, by being in a sense alienated. And for many years, I never saw her because, um, and for 26, for a quarter of a century, I didn't go home to see her because I couldn't bear the thought you know, at all. But after 26 years, I said, look, it's, um, I must make the effort. So I went back to see her. And, um, and the first thing she said to me, she said, oh yes, she said, um, you have lived for so long in the West. 
I suppose you are smoking, she said. <laughs> so I said, uh, well, if the truth be told, I said, I was equally brutal and brutish. So I say, if the truth be told, I said, I never smoked. Not a single cigarette ever crossed my lips. I said, do you know why? I said, because I use you as a negative model. Because you were a smoke, you are a smoker. By then she had been told to, to leave off smoking. So she was then <laughs> no longer a smoker, but she had smoked all her life since she was a child in her late, in her early adolescence. And, um, and so I said, you were a negative model. I said, the fact of seeing you with that fag, I said, is enough to put me off. <laughs> I said, never smoked. Thank you. <laughs> so you see, my relationship to my mother was very, very fraught, very, very fraught. And so I thought I'd do my act of filial piety when I went back, not having seen her for 25 years. She was at that time in a nursing home because my cousin who used to live with her couldn't cope. But I made sure that I brought her out of the nursing home for, um, for, three, for the three weeks I stayed with her and looked after her myself. Um, but she, things didn't really improve. My efforts didn't didn't do much to mellow her attitude towards me either. I might be unkind because, uh, let me put it this way, different members of the family have different recollections about other members of the family. So if you ask my sister in, uh, in Australia, she will give you a very different version of my mother, that my mother was most loving, was one of the kindest women she ever knew. Whereas I, on the other hand, give you an opposite view. So I would like to, to uh, leave you with that thought that this is only my own relationship to my mother that I'm giving you an account of. It doesn't mean that she was like that to all her children, right? Maybe because of this relationship. Uh, so yeah. so you, you have uh, this um, uh, impetus <laughs> to excel and also to choose your own path. That's right. That's right. I'm afraid so. I was born a bit wild anyway. And so uh, with this kind of antagonism, it, I suppose, encouraged me to carry it even further, almost as a means of survival, I think, given that my mother was a powerful personality. And as the other members of my family, I only actually have my sister living now in Australia. The others are all passed away. They used to say to me, you are an equally dominant female yourself. So when two dominant females get together, there is no space for both. So one of us has to bow out. So I choose the path of, you know, leave um, sort of going away as far away as possible. <laughs> but, well, you didn't want to do medicine, but then yes. you've taken up the philosophy of medicine. Ah, uh, yes, 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 that was later. That was later. But uh, there were many things which prompted me in that direction in the end. Uh, but before I tell you that story, Maybe one other story I should uh, tell you about is my interest in, uh, in Chinese philosophy in the end, because as a philosopher, <clears throat> since I was put through the paces of a colonial education and I, the University of, Malaysia, of Malaya, later called the University of Singapore, or that bit of it, uh, the philosophy we were taught was simply Anglo-Saxon analytical philosophy based on the so-called Oxford School of Philosophy of that time. So when I finished my first degree there and taught for a bit in Singapore, um, I got a Commonwealth scholarship to Oxford to do what is called the BPhil. The BPhil is a special degree which was structured 
um, particularly to enable academics to get the degree and then to go and teach their subject. So I went to Oxford to do the BPhil in philosophy. And now at that time, the, you can call him the program director in today's terminology of the BPhil uh, program in philosophy is the great Professor Gilbert Ryle. Now, to those of you who don't know about that tradition of philosophy, you wouldn't know he was great. <laughs> but to someone like me, who had to read his work and so on, he was certainly the great man, right? He wrote a book called, I think, The Concept of Mind or something. And in, in, in any case, so he sent out a message the moment um, uh, students got to Oxford that all BPhil students in philosophy have go, got to say, go and see him, pay our respects to him. So I did. I knocked on his door. He was a fellow of Magdalen College in Oxford and knocked on his door. And you can imagine this scene, right? Um, he was indeed seated in a very, very deep armchair, leather armchair in, in his study in Maudling. I knocked on the door and I heard a gruff voice from the other side saying, come in, he says. And so I gingerly opened the door. But even before I opened the door and he saw his face, he barked out at me there is no such thing as Chinese philosophy. I was so gobsmacked. He hasn't seen my face. But from my application form, he knew that I must be Chinese of some description, you see. And I think preceding me was a, was a person around my age. I came to know her later from Taiwan. And this good student, must have, she wasn't doing the B-field, she was doing the B-lit, but nevertheless, you know, she must have been the one to ask him about Chinese philosophy, whether it's taught at all in Oxford. And so he was fed up to the teeth of Chinese students <laughs> asking him such a question. So before I even appeared in it, saw my face, he barked at me, there's no such thing as Chinese philosophy. What could I do? I couldn't contest that. For a start, at that time, I didn't know very much about Chinese philosophy, but I knew enough to know that he must be talking hot air, but I couldn't challenge him, as submissive as I was, because I knew that my b -fill was at stake. If I challenged him, I'd never pass my exams. So I kept quiet, went in. Fortunately, he didn't continue this line of discussion anymore, and we talked about something uh, about what subjects I would choose for my BPhil exams. So fine. So I parked it at the back of my mind, and for years it haunted me. Until of late, uh, when I start uh, after my because for thirty three years I taught nothing but. Um, uh, philosophy, modern philosophy, Western philosophy. I had no time to look into Chinese philosophy uh, and any other thing than what my teaching duties require me to do. But when I retired in 1999, I started looking into the matter. And then I finally, to my satisfaction, traced where, can't, uh, where um, Gilbert Rao has got this idea from that there's no such thing as Chinese philosophy. I traced it back to the great Immanuel Kant. Now, as we all know, Kant is the great enlightenment philosopher and Kant uh, of the three critiques, you see, uh, which put modern philosophy um, on the right footing as it were, and so Kant, of course, is on a pedestal amongst Western, uh, modern Western philosophers. So I discovered that Kant, apart from writing the three critiques, actually spent 40 years of his life every summer lecturing on geography. And he is credited by modern geographers for having set out the discipline of modern geography, according to some, some geographers, that is not all geographers. So anyway, 
And to my uh, uh, great amusement and surprise, I found that in the end, um, this great thought of Gilbert Ryle, that there's no such thing as Chinese philosophy, is traced to Kant in his lectures uh, in geography, which he gave every summer for 40 years uh, in, uh, in the, uh, where he lived in Königsberg. And Kant had said, philosophy is not to be found in the Orient. That was Kant's own words translated from German. So there's no such thing as Chinese philosophy is a derivation from philosophy is not to be found in, in the Orient. And I found that this mantra that philosophy is not to be found in, in the Orient was then picked up by, uh, by Hegel, Husserl, Heidegger, Ryle, and then Derrida. So, so you see, six big names in, 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 in modern Western philosophy all have chanted the same, same mantra. So as a result, I said, oh, well, that is indeed given my personality. Oh, a very good reason for delving further into the subject. If you say that there's no such subject, then there must be a subject. <laughs> so I delve more and more into Chinese philosophy. And also given that I have always been interested in the philosophy of biology and of ecology. So it was one step to the philosophy of medicine and comparative. So that's why in the end, I found myself in my late age, interested in uh, comparative philosophy and uh, different, uh, namely the Chinese philosophical tradition and the Western philosophical tradition. And um, in, the, in the philosophy of medicine, you know, the, the comparative philosophy of medicine, of Chinese medicine, classical Chinese medicine and of uh, biomedicine. <laughs> Um, during my stay in Oxford, in fact, I decided that the way to survive is just um, to carry on uh, with the syllabus as required. I, there were nobody in Oxford who was remotely interested in Chinese philosophy that I knew of. And so the subject never arose as such because the environment was just not favorable to a, a discussion to raising such a subject anyway. Um, when I got back to Singapore later on, in the Department of Philosophy, which I taught at the University of Singapore, it was equally Eurocentric uh, centric and Anglocentric. So again, there was nobody who was interested. So I never bothered to raise it with anyone. And when finally I left uh, um, Singapore for Manchester, it was the same story. Um, nobody would have a clue, nor would they want to know, even if, they, uh, if you were about to interest them. So my interest in Chinese philosophy and Chinese matters became a very dormant thing for many years of my life until my retirement. I took early retirement in 1999. And so for more than 20 years now, I have felt free finally, liberated myself from the confines, the confines of my earlier preoccupation and do what I please. And so as a result, I delve more and more into Chinese philosophy. Now, I actually came to Chinese philosophy per se via Chinese medicine, because my, uh, first of all, because of certain personal events in my own life, I became very, very uh, involved with Chinese medicine, using it as a medicine for members of my family. And, and then my own thesis that for a medicine, medicine, like any other discipline, 
requires a philosophy to back it up. So uh, I said, let me then try to excavate the philosophy behind Chinese medicine. So in that sense, the two interests ran parallel or the one was embedded in the other. So my, 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 my two books on Chinese medicine actually contains a lot of, primarily is philosophy, but because the audience is different, so I wrote it just differently. And I've since now excavated, as it were, the um, philosophical components from those volumes, enlarged the matter, and with a bit of luck, then De Gruyter is going to publish it as intercultural philosophy. When it will come out, I don't know. They've signed a contract with me, but they're dragging their feet. I haven't heard from them for a long time on the matter. So this is how it is. So if you want to know my preoccupation with Chinese matters, um, I've been thinking about the subject. You could say <clears throat> um, it lies very deep in me. First of all, my, my father, like a lot of people who fancy themselves to be scholars of some description, my father was an academic monkey. His life was such that he couldn't be an academic. So he, he rather fancied himself to be an academic and a scholar. So like all uh, Chinese scholars, they dabbled in Chinese medicine, right? So, um, so vaguely in my childhood, I've heard something about Chinese medicine, although I never paid it much attention. And then also there is an episode in my own life, which in retrospect must have made an impression on me and made me very favorable to Chinese medicine in general. Uh, this episode was that when I was a child, um, between say the ages of eight and 12 or 13, I'm not too sure now, every year I used to suffer from a skin ailment which um, prevented me from going to school. And this ailment was very curious. <clears throat> my, my, my parents or my mother took me to the doctor, the Western trained doctor <clears throat> down, the, down the road from us. And oh, he had no clue, of course. So all that he did was to mix up with his pharma uh, in his pharmacy, some, some chamomile lotion and asked me to plaster myself with the chamomile no, uh, lotion, which I did, but it didn't help. But after a bit of, it wasn't painful or anything, but it's just uh, disagreeable, the condition, because now it's <laughs> not a nice condition to describe, but uh, uh, it consists of boils appearing all over my arms and my chest. And when the boils burst, the pus of the juice or whatever you call it, the liquid in the boil will travel down, of course, the body. And wherever they travel, a new boil <laughs> appear. So it went down for about a month and then it will suddenly disappear of its own. The chamomile, I don't think, did anything, right? So uh, this went on for a few years. And my mother and my parents were looking out for a cure uh, anywhere possible. And of course they, they look out for Chinese stuff. And one day my mother apparently went to the market, the local market, and people told her, you know, there is a, 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 somebody who, who goes to the jungle to collect herbs, you know, and he sells them. I suppose today, uh, in proper Chinese terms, you're called uh, such a person a lang chung, because he had no proper qualifications of any kind, you know, and um, whether he, how educated he was, I wouldn't know. But anyway, he knew his uh, one, one plant from another plant and he collected the right ones to kill people. That's all we need to know, basically. So my mother went to him in the market to explain my condition to him and asked him uh, if he would collect some herbs for her daughter. And he did. And one day he came back with a bag of herbs and gave it to my mother. 
before we she paid him, I suppose. And I told her what to do, and she chopped it all up so that it becomes, you know, soggy and juicy, and um, plastered all over me, um, and tied me up. And uh, lo and behold, miraculously, not only did the condition disappear in, uh, immediately or after one or two of such uh, treatments, but it never recurred again. No more recurrence. Got rid of it for good. Now, that must have impressed to me very much, right? So I parked it in the back of my mind, didn't do anything about it. And in the meantime, I have uh, other battles to contend with, as it were. And one of these battles was in school, because the school were saying uh, the nuns and uh, not, all, not all the teachers were nuns, they were secular staff as well, but the teachers at the common school I went to were all giving you a colonial education anyway. And so they would say, mm, you know, anything Chinese is no good. Uh, nothing exists in Chinese culture anyway. So I would go home and recycle this to my father. And I said, you tell me, that in Chinese culture, X, Y, and Z exist. I said, the nuns say no. So I said, where? Like the awkward child that I was, I said, where is your evidence to convince me <laughs> that the nuns are wrong? So he said, of course, plenty of evidence exists. But he said, we're living in Malaysia, you know, and Malaysia is not rich in <laughs> cultural scholarship of any kind. So he said, and he said, quite telling you, to the point, he said, in any case, he said, even if I can get, lay hands on the books for you to read, you won't be able to read them anyway, he said. So I said, oh, you have a point there, haven't you? So I belted up <laughs> and went away and, and subconsciously mulled over this. Now, of course, in 1957, which is a key date for me, although I didn't know it then, but I entered the University of Singapore, or Malaya, uh, called then. That was the year when Joseph Needham and his co-author published, you know, the first volume of science and uh, 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 Chinese civilization series uh, in philosophy in particular as well. And of course, uh, it wasn't much later than, it was much later than 1957 when I read the book because I, I tell you, I lived, in a remote part of the British Empire, books don't come one's way immediately, they were published. So it took many years before I finally realized that Needham and co had published this work. Uh, and, so, um, and so that was another line which fed it, uh, into my own thinking. But in the meantime, on the Chinese medical front, as a matter of medicine, what happened, the most critical thing in my life was, uh, in fact, when my son, when he was about 13, uh, had a car accident. He was a dreamy boy. And the school staff at that time was carrying on a cat strike. In other words, uh, during lunchtime, the school lunch hour, they weren't going to supervise the children in the playground anymore because uh, they, they continue to teach, but these extra duties they weren't taking on. It was part of a lightning kite cat strike. So that day, my son and his pals cross a very busy road, which, which is in fact is a motorway, uh, a, a sort of, not motorway, a dual carriageway because in the morning they had a ball which they were playing. They kicked the ball and it went up a roof and disappeared into somebody's garden. So they needed to cross the road to the shop to buy a new ball. So everybody else being more alert than my son, um, they saw a car coming and they quickly ran across to the central, uh, uh, to the central uh, space. So they were okay. But my son was a bit dragging his feet and didn't realize that a car was coming. And so the car swept him underneath 
uh, uh, its its body, dragged him up. The, the school staff told, later told me they dragged him a hundred feet, then stopped. But fortunately, the car was a big car. It was a Volvo. And as a result, the undercarriage space, the, the space below the, the, the undercarriage was quite large. So it didn't squash him to death. Otherwise he would have died. It was a smaller car. So as a result, he had numerous uh, injuries, fractures here then and everywhere. It was rushed to hospital. And the hospital took good care of him in a sense. They carried out all the regulations which was required of them. They kept him uh, under monitoring to see if there was any brain injury. And they decided there was no brain injury, but the rest were just uh, physical injuries to his, uh, to, to, to his uh, leg, especially, and, and, and other bits of him. Now, um, I was re we were relieved as parents to have this positive, um, analysis but I said to my husband I said I said I would like a second opinion I said it's no good hiring a private consultant for a first in medicine to have a second opinion because he'll probably tell you the same thing so I said I would like an opinion from Chinese medicine because now this is where Lao Chien Ye was on our side. I don't know what my ancestors had done in the past to earn such good grace. But anyway, just at that time, there appeared in Manchester, this fabulous, brilliant Chinese physician. And my, I, I told you earlier on that my brother played a, a, big, a biggish role in the affairs of the Chinese community in Manchester. And he had heard over the grapevine that this man who's brilliant has just arrived. So of course, when I think of anything Chinese, I immediately get uh, in touch with my brother. And I said, look, I said, uh, can you find me a Chinese um, doctor, uh, physician? So he said, oh, we are in luck, you know, there have come a, a, a man who is known to be very good. He's just this minute arrived in Manchester. So I said, fine, bring him. And fortunately, being a Chinese physician, he doesn't have any gear to show that he was a, medi uh, a medical person, right? He just walked in like an old uncle. <laughs> and, and so the, the, the hospital never knew that I had a consultant, another kind of consultant looking at my son. And he just got to the door of the room where Jonathan was. And he took one look and he said to me, I said, the medics here tell me that he has got no internal injury, but I'm not convinced by that. So he said, you're quite right. He has got internal injury. I can tell even from the door standing here that he has. Well, I said, now, how do you know standing from the door? So he said, first of all, you've told me that he couldn't stand heat. And that during the night, I spend the night with my son, you see, uh, uh, by his bedside. He had flung off all his bedding. So you see, it's too hot for him, too much heat. And he said, secondly, look at his lips. Oh, I didn't look at him. He says, his lips are dry, aren't they? So I said, yes, they're peeling. I said, yeah, yeah. I, what does it mean? He says, yes. Yeah. The lips are the uh, opening of the spleen. So he has got spleen injury. So I, I said, yes, yes, you may be right. I said, there is a part of his body, you know, <laughs> which has a deep gash. I said, that's where probably the spleen, my, you know, my knowledge of anatomy is not good at all. So I said, you go and have a look. And he went and have a look and indeed it was a spleen. So he said, um, I said, what would I do? So he said, um, he, he, then, uh, he then looked at his fractured leg as well. He said, that's not done in an ideal fashion. He would have trouble, you know. So I said, uh, he said, if I were you, I'll take him home and I'll treat him. So I said, I can't, he can't because he's on a, a strapped up there, you see. So on the pulley, so I said, I can't take it out on traction. So I said, why not have a division of labor? They look after his fractured 
leg and you look after his innards. So he said, oh, well, fine, it's the best we can do. But he said, all the same, when they take him down from traction, the first thing you must do is to bring him to me because I don't believe that their method is any good. So I said, good, when he's out of traction, I'll take him to you. So anyway, in the meantime, he treated Jonathan's spleen. <clears throat> and he told me, he said, I've never treated an injured, damaged spleen in all my life as a clinician in China. He said, he said, I will have to think about it, what to do. He said, I will ring up my brother. His brother was still in Fujian. My brother, and we will have a discussion. And so uh, he spent that evening bringing up his brother in Fujian. And between them, they con concocted a prescription for Jonathan. And he told me what to do. And I therefore had to run two medicines one behind the other. I couldn't let the hospital know that he was having Chinese medicine. And, and Deng, Deng Xi was is the name of the, of the physician. And, 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 and Deng Yisheng has told me that he mustn't have any of the antibiotics which you were giving him. So I had to intercept the antibiotics, pretended I had given them to him, but actually I flushed them down the loo. And so I had to bring, I had to decoct the uh, herbs at home, then put it in a, in, a, in a flask and take it to him to the hospital. And, and fortunately, Jonathan was a very uh, good child and he did what he was told and he drank the medicine with no fuss, not bother, no bother, because Chinese medicine is no fun to drink, as we all know, but he, he drank it. And then that, uh, this uh, um, uh, Deng Yisheng had told me that if the prescription works, he says he, he cannot guarantee because he had never used it before. He said if it works and it was working on the spleen, he said then you should a few hours after you have administered the, the, the medicine to him, there should be a great rumbling noise that you can hear. It's very loud, he says. He says, don't be worried, he says. It just means that the medicine is, is, having, is, is being efficacious, you see. So, okay, I gave Jonathan the medicine at about 7.30 or thereabouts. And at 11 o'clock, indeed, a ginormous rumbling through. <laughs> it rumbled and rumbled and rumbled for a long time. And I got, I wasn't cool at all by then. I got cold, cold feet. So I rang him up and it was towards midnight. I said, I said, Dong Yisheng, I'm afraid. The rumbling is still going on. And I'm really well. So he was not pleased because I got him out of bed. I said, I told you, silly woman, <laughs> this would happen. Why are you waking me up? So I said, I'm very, very sorry. So he said, go back to your son. He said, nothing wrong. It means that a medicine is working. Oh, okay, fine. And I put down the phone, felt very bad and embarrassed having woken him up. But he was very sweet and kind anyway. But uh, however, so... Um, now, the other traumatic thing one had to face in a hospital when you're running two medicines, one behind the other, is the medicine asked me, the medical people, the whole staff in the hospital asked me, I've got to give a pee sample, a pee sample. So I said, how the hell would one give a pee sample when with all that rumbling that had taken place during the night? And uh, and I'm sure if Deng Hu is right, the, the spleen is um, expelling clotted blood probably, and it will be full of clotted blood. And if the hospital found out that there's clotted blood, uh, the hospital, as some predicted, would take him down, open him up, and remove half his spleen, if not the whole of it. So, who can't have that happening? So, what the hell does one do, right? So, while this was happening, I asked my daughter, 
I said, look, the hospital wants a specimen of the pea. So I said, at 7 o'clock tonight, at 5.30 or whatever time in the evening, uh, late afternoon, early evening, that we went to see Jonathan in the hospital. I said, if his pea is still, you know, full of uh, black clots that one can see with the naked eye. I said, I can't submit that. Uh, that Otherwise, Tung said he would have to be taken down to have his spleen half removed, impartially removed, if not fully removed. And the spleen is a vital tongue, you see. Uh, 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 or is it a fool? <laughs> it's a, a bit of tongue fool, anyway. And so, uh, so I said, I can't let him. So I, oh, I had asked for Rebecca's permission. I said, if Jonathan's pee turns out to be full of clots that one could see with the naked eye, I said, you will have to pee in the pot and I will have to masquerade your pee as his. They would know, you see. I said, so Rebecca was willing to do this. So it was all lined up. But fortunately, fortunately, by the time the pea sample was asked for in the early evening of the following day. I tested Jonathan's pea and I put it through the, 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 the specimen jar. And I saw that actually you can still see, but not real clots, but little specks. So I said, okay, Rebecca. It's not as bad as real clots, which was what came out earlier. So I said, maybe this would do. And I also know that um, these kind of submission of specimens to the lab, to the path lab, the hospital doesn't have its own path lab. It has got to be sent to a hematological pad lab somewhere in Cheshire. <laughs> so I said, it'd take a few days. So by then I think Dung would have put Jonathan right. And if they want to, te uh, to test, uh, I said before they threatened to take his, him down for an operation, I would insist that they have another pea sample and then there will be no more of these even little specks. So that was our scheme, you see. And it worked, it worked. So he was never taken down and cured him. And after uh, two or three days of this, uh, two days of this uh, prescription, Jonathan seemed fine. No more clots, no more specks in, in, in the thing. So I started celebrating. So Lishan told me, don't celebrate too soon. He said that this kind of inter internal injury, it comes out bit by bit, slowly. Now that the spleen has performed, there will be reaction from elsewhere. So watch out for it, she said. Now indeed, Soon Jonathan was in high fever again, and this time Dung Dad knew it was a stomach. So the stomach also had some injury and it was coming out. So he took care of that. And he says, don't celebrate yet. He said, it could be another part of him, of his downfall, which will react. And indeed, uh, two weeks later, it was the turn of his small, um, uh, of his, um, not his bladder, but the um, urethra, and so on and so forth. But finally, it was all, all, all sorted out. And then uh, his internal injuries were taken care of. He lay in traction in hospital for two months, Jonathan. And when finally they took him down, uh, the uh, the um, ortho orthopedic surgeon removed the cast from him, and uh, and I was there, and then I saw to my horror that the injured foot was an, at least an, uh, two inches, if not an inch and a half, shorter than a good foot. Oh dear! So I said to the <laughs> consultant orthopedic surgeon. So I said, what do you plan to do? And he told me with great insouciance. He said, nothing, he said. He's only 13. 
Eventually, the body will write itself, he says. Wait till he's 21. He may be all right by then, but in the meantime, he will, of course, walk with a limp, he said. So I said, look, I said, what if at the age of 18 or 21, the body hadn't compensated? What do you do then? So he says, oh, quite simple. Have another operation to the sole of his uh, uh, the feet and put in a piece of plaster two and a half inches high so that will even out the inequality. So I said, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know quickly, <laughs> Jonathan <laughs> to don't see. And I said, that's what they tell me. He said, oh, they would, wouldn't they? So in, in Dr. Dung's, in Dung Yixiong's explanation, it's, it went something like this, as far as I can recall, that when he was up in traction and as his fracture healed and the muscles the muscles then, because he's up in traction, pulled the leg upwards towards his body. So as a result, when he is out of traction, the muscles were still holding up, <laughs> still holding up the uh, now healed leg. So as a result, he says, uh, there is a gap of uh, a, a difference of about two and a half inches. So he said that is one possible explanation. He said, let's be optimistic and try this hypothesis first, that it's the muscles holding up the repaired leg. So he said, if what I'm now telling you to do doesn't work, then we would have to be drastic. I would just have to break his leg artificially, he says, and then do it myself. Because he said, you remember I told you it was not done ideally and this is what happens. So I said, oh yes, yes. So he says, let's hope the original, the first hypothesis uh, will turn out right. So I said, how do you then bring the leg down with the muscles being so taut holding it up? So he says, let's try this. So he gave me a whole lot of things that I had to do with Jonathan, including uh, decocting certain herbs, which will, which I would then use to bathe his leg in to loosen the muscle. It was a kind of muscle loosening uh, prescription that he used and so on and so forth. And also other forms of exercises that Johnson, he told him to do as well. So eventually uh, with all these uh, methods, the leg indeed dropped. So, he said, now it is e even, but don't expect it to stay even for at least six weeks. It will shoot up and come down again, shoot up and come down again. And it wouldn't be until uh, uh, six, um, uh, at least a year later before the, his limp will be, um, not so obvious. So any, every word that he says is correct. Every word he said turned out the timing and everything was correct. So we were really, really impressed, right? Because the hospital couldn't do anything, but it was, so the hospital saved his life because they did give him a blood transfusion at that time. And so that did save us. So for which we are very grateful, of course, to biomedicine for having done that for him. But after that, they hadn't got any more clue. And uh, if we had left it only to the hospital, Jonathan would be alive today, but he would be an invalid because the injury, the internal injuries will play up and the older you get, the worse it becomes, as we all know. So we are very grateful in the end that between the two medicines, Jonathan became a whole person uh, after the accident. So that was very, very um, striking an experience in our life, you know. Uh, the role that Chinese medicine played. But there's also one other role which I must tell you, because this concerns Colin, my husband. Now, oh, 
But I first met Colin, which was, a, mm, we married in 1973, so it would be a pretty long time ago. So um, in those days, um, what is called jaundice. Jaundice was, uh, was uh, a big thing. It still is, I think, in the West. But Colin had uh, jaundice. No, 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 it wasn't jaundice. Oh, what rubbish am I talking about? It, is, it was glandular fever he had, glandular fever, uh, in which he suffered a lot. And as usual, his old doctor couldn't do much for him and told him to rest. So, so with glandular fever, the aftermath of glandular fever is if you become subjected to new stresses and strain, it can reappear. So when Jonathan's accident happened, Colin was under great stress and pressure. And so his glandular fever appeared. So while having to nurse Jonathan in hospital, I had to nurse him as well because he had about <laughs> a recurrence of glandular fever, lying in bed, you know, I know, totally exhausted, couldn't do a thing. And so, and so um, Colin said, ooh, Dung is so good with Jonathan. Please ask him if he has any cure for glandular fever. So I said, I'll do my best. So I spoke to Dung uh, and I said, this is. So I checked up in all the dictionaries, uh, bilingual dictionaries, on what the hell glandular fever is. I couldn't find a term. Today, I think they have a fancy term for it, but in those days, there was no such fancy term. And so I described in great detail his symptoms to Dong Si. And Dong Si said, I've never come across such a case in my clinical experience in China. Mm, he said, I'll have to think about it. So he went away and thought about it yet again. And the next day, he rang me up and he said, I think I know what you mean. He said, I've never treated such a patient because in China, we don't have such patients really. But I do remember my grandmother telling me that sometimes in the village, a person may begin to have such symptoms. And all that you do is to boil up some jin jin chai and some hong tang, a piece of hong tang, uh, dissolve it, um, boil it a bit, and then the person drinks this and the, and the condition will go. So he didn't trust me to go to the Chinese supermarket <laughs> to buy the ginger chai. And he took me, bought the ginger chai himself and the hong tang and told me precisely what to do. And I did it. And lo and behold, indeed, after even one <laughs> cup, Colin was okay, it was fine. So the ginger chai and the hong tang is what you do with glandular fever. Now then, I try to explain to myself, I thought more about it, why Dong says in China you don't really see people with glandular fever. And I tumbled to this explanation. It is a hypothesis. I don't know how sound it is, but it seems to be plausible. And that is, in Chinese cuisine, we are not all vegans or vegetarians, but even those of us who eat meat, at some stage in the, in, in the year, such as, you know, uh, oh, after the feasting of the uh, of Chinese New, of New Year's Eve, then you have a period where you eat su. So when you eat su, an ingredient which goes into um, our vegetarian Chinese vegetable is ginger chai. So in other words, every Chinese, if you stick to traditional Chinese cooking during the year, at some stage you will have eaten ginger chai. And this ginger chai then protects you from glandular fever. That's why glandular fever is not known in China, but in the West, plenty of it. So that is my explanation. 
Kinchi, I think you are more the person to pronounce on this than I am. But that's my thought, which I carried with me all these years. So I really don't know. It would be interesting uh, to look further uh, into the business, I suppose. But and so for years after, when I was teaching, and I see a student not having appeared for three weeks, two weeks, and I ask them, I say, you've been sunbathing in the Costa Bravo, haven't you? Running away from classes and tutorial. And the poor student will present, oh, no, 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 I'm not done such a naughty thing. I was sick, ill at home. So I said, ill with what? They say, with glandular fever. Oh, so I said. I said, do you want, so he said, I'm still having this after effects of glandular fever. I'm not at my best now. I have rested, but not at my best. So I asked the students, and they, every time they give me that excuse, glandular fever. So I asked, do you want to be rid of it? They said, yes, of course we would like to be rid of it. So I said, it's by mumbo jumbo, you know. So they said, so I said, it wouldn't kill you, this mumbo jumbo because it's a veg vegetable, and vegetables don't kill people, do they, if it enters into all the Chinese cooking. So they agreed with me, they said, it can't kill. So I said, I will prepare it for you, and I'll make you drink it. But I said, you mustn't tell anybody. So I said, if the authorities in the university come to know I'm running this kind of mumbo jumbo, <laughs> I said, I'll be sacked. So they all say, of course, we'll keep no. So a very good uh, a colleague in the department is a very, very good friend. I told him. And so he used to send his students with glandular fever to me. And we, we, we all saw ourselves with secrecy. So, uh, after, so and another day after I prescribed this, uh, make them drink it. They appear and I said, any more trouble? I said, no. No trouble. <laughs> so, so I've tested it out on quite a few students and, and they all survived your intact. So bear this in mind, if ever you come across glandular fever, it's Jinjun Chai and hometown. <laughs> a handful of the one and a small lump of the other and you'll be fine, right? <laughs> so um, that's my story. So. Um, Again, you see, it's one, one of these things in my life, you know, which made me um, very fascinated and very interested in the subject, quite apart from my own preoccupation with, with, with biology and ecology and therefore with medicine in general. It's really fascinating. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, um, well, um, we have actually gone uh, to it. We have actually gone two hours, uh, oh, <laughs> and, this, and I think it's actually near lunchtime for you. But maybe I think we can continue with these uh, discussions if it is okay with you. But I'd like to know whether Tong Yi or Jade or the friends here, uh, they have some question they very much want to ask. <laughs> Uh, maybe just one question is, um, well, your your brother, uh, no, the, the brother of your father. Uh, who oh, was, yes, yes, yes. Is, is he an elder brother? No, a younger oh. brother, a younger oh, yeah. brother. Yeah, he was, uh, because all trade union activity at that time were considered as communist. Mm. Controlled and communist run. So it was as a communist that he was being arrested and he fled. But did, did he get uh, arrested? He, no, he fled. But he, my my father said that he, he, he wasn't. So he says, a junta. Yes. No but need to run away. <laughs> he, says, he, says, oh, he says he's not a communist. And, but to be, uh, truth be told, he never signed up to an organization. This is true. But my piecing together in his life showed that he was a uh, communist sympathizer. 
So, <laughs> so, but whatever, just as if people ask me today, oh, what ideology do I profess? So I profess no particular ideology. But if pressed, I would say my ideal society, and which I've written about it anyway, would be either the, uh, the William Morris view of socialism or the early Marx. So in that sense, I consider myself a Marxist because I do believe that the, not the later Marx, but the early Marx vision is a vision of a good society. Um, and, and I believe in it. So maybe I have some communist genes in me, some in my DNA too, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so there you are. Then uh, at that time, your father uh, was married uh, because then he later he went uh, with your mother. Yes, That's right. they were uh, married. Then they were married. Did they have any bit. children at, uh, as yet? Uh, well, I really don't know because they say that we were all born in Malaysia. Ah, okay. Yes. So I suppose it was easier for them when they to to exile themselves without children. Anyway. So, and all of us have uh, certificates, <laughs> you know, registered in Malaysia, uh, Malaya uh, as the place of our birth. So I, I don't suppose they would have, because they came very early in the 1920s when all these things were happening. But uh, what did your father do? He had a scholarly bent. <laughs> Yeah, but, but he couldn't make a living, you see. It was my mother who uh, who um, managed to keep the family together. So my mother, I do owe a lot to my mother. And um, because she was a financial genius, so she made the family. <laughs> she made the money in the family and she kept the family together. My father was useless. That is why she in her irritation, told my father, I don't want you to talk about your Lee and feudal glories to them. It only corrupts them <laughs> and they'll never be able to live properly. So he said, we are now living a very different life. So let's have no talk about the past. So my father didn't, as a result, talk about the Lee family. So it was later, well after I've left home, you know, um, well, well after I'd left home, that he gave us a copy of the family genealogy. So there's a side of my family that uh, nobody knew about in, when I was in Malaysia and Singapore, because I didn't know very much about it myself then. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> 